Nigel? Sam? Lead us in, Nigel. <laughs> no? No, Nigel? No. He's, nope. he's having some technical difficulties. He's having tough time. Uh, okay. All right. All right. Well, let's start this off. Uh, so this is the Flatiron Syndicate Motorsports Podcast, episode number 20, the, the big two zero. Um, if you're If you're watching this at home, because uh, we got some questions uh, last time. The reason that a lot of us are wearing masks is because we're all in the shop and it looks like we're far apart, but we're not because there's Viet and there's Nigel. So we just, we have to have masks on. So that's, that's why we're doing this. But we got uh, Dussex and Tasso here with us. Uh, so they're, they're at their own respective places. And so they don't have to be uh, incognito as we do. So just, just so you're aware going forward, that's uh, that's why we're we're in disguise, if you will. Um, I just want to say at the beginning of this, if you like if you like this podcast, if you like the content and stuff that we're putting out, please like and subscribe to either our YouTube channel or our our iTunes podcast. That'd be fantastic. That helps the channel grow. We really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, just just you know anything you can do to help, we we greatly appreciate it. And, and we thank you guys for listening and thank you guys for your support. So we're here today with Tasso from OTC Racing. We've got Ryan from DSX Motorsports. Nigel, uh, you know me racing or uh, WRX Buddy. And we got uh, Viet from uh, 919 Garage. And what we're going to talk about today is what is the best or cheapest way to build a race car. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of us are enthusiasts that are coming in and, and maybe we have a, a a daily driver, a car that we modified, but now we're coming to the point, or maybe you're coming to the point where you want to start competing, where you kind of have to cross this point of no return. You know, you can, you can go so far with the daily driver car, with a car that just kind of has, let's call it factory safety equipment. But then there's a point where you kind of have to make a commitment to make the car into a race car or a competition car. And there's, there's maybe a little bit of gray area there in certain classes that don't require as much safety gear. But if you're looking at jumping in, into making like a fully purpose-built race car, there's, there's a lot of questions like, how do you do it? Where do you, where do you start? And what's the best way to do it? And we've got a lot of people here that have got some experience doing that. So we wanted to kind of broach that subject and, and give some perspectives on it. So... So with that uh, being said, who wants to you know, who wants to jump in with whatever wherever they started with the old uh, race car build on our personal builds? Sure. Or yeah. uh, tackle tackle the the elephant in the room, which is building or buying. Which one do you want to do first? Ooh, well, maybe maybe let's start with just where you got your cars from. So, so sure. like Tasso, where did you get your your rally car? Where did how did that start life, or where did it first come into your into your possession? Sure. So back in 2013, um, I was looking for a competitive outlet. Uh, I wasn't racing bikes anymore. Um, I needed, I wanted um, to to kind of get back into competition of some sort. I was daily driving um, an old Dodge pickup that had at any one time, usually four wheels. Um, That's a good start. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it lost wheels from time to time. So I needed a daily, I wanted something sporty. I kind of knew that like SCCA Rallycross existed. Um, I didn't know much about it. I'd always wanted an Evo from all the way back in high school. Sure. Um, I really wanted an Evo 9. I thought the fact that it had, you know, center diff, settings for tarmac gravel and snow was the coolest thing ever and they look cool whatever but yeah. they're thirty thousand dollars for a mostly wrecked one that's two states away so i said forget that i figured well i'll get an sti then stis are also too expensive especially out here in colorado mm. so someone said get a wrx it's like a half liter less than one gear less than an sti so okay yeah RXs are still expensive, um, but I found one actually uh, that happened to be for sale from a couple, um, this husband and wife that were racing rallycross. I uh, 
I liked that. Even though the car was a little modified, I wanted a pretty stock car. But the fact that they were part of the community meant that, you know, they weren't just going to, like, you know, dump a dump a mess on me and disappear. Sure. I, and also I had them as an, as an avenue um, into that sport, into rallycross. So I had a week of time um, in September of 2013 where I got probably 150 hours of overtime that week. Uh, so I bought this car cash. Um, I bought a 2004 red WRX cash. Uh, now, now, at that point, did it have the cage in it or did it not have the cage in it? Nothing. It had okay. been motor mounts. <clears throat> okay. Uh, stage two ish pro tune. And that was it. Okay. It was, um, a 17 inch wheel instead of a 16. Um, which was factory at the time that for that model was 16. So, sure. so it turns out it had a motor in it at some point. Um, actually, as I then went on to rally cross the car, like so many people would come up to be like, Oh, do you have the lost and sold car? Man, I remember putting the motor in that thing. Or do you have the lost and sold car? I remember fixing this on that car. And so suddenly I had a car that was everyone had experience with it. Well known me. in the community. It was well known. It had already had. Um, a prepared all-wheel drive national championship win. Oh, wow. Rallycross. Um, so I got the car. I did one or two prepared all-wheel drive races. Um, oh, it had a what, – what's the cheap Torsen diff that you can put in, the really cheap one? Ooh. Front end? Uh, M Factory or something? No, I, I know what you're talking about. O OBX? OBX. OBX. Yes. Oh, OBX. yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OBX front diff also, which I guess means the transmission was gone through at some point. Right. Uh, but it had already, I don't know which one's not swearing. It had already crapped out its Belleville washers. So, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there were chunks of washers that came out every time. I And it was, you know, taking teeth off of the rear diff and stuff. Like there's a little two pinion viscous rear diff in there. Hmm. I think I'd do another... I can't leave anything alone. So I uh, went to mod all wheel drive pretty quickly after one or two races, um, started gutting the car, started getting more serious about rally cross really only did like one full season in mod. Um, then I decided that I couldn't leave that alone. Um, even, you know, rally cross was, fun. I was enjoying it. I enjoyed the community, but I needed more. I co-drove for another guy at a hill climb um and decided i had to do that and continually playing through my head was the old warren miller quote the ski movie guy if you don't do it this year you'll just be one year older when you do and at the time i was thinking to myself man like i'm like in my mid-20s i gotta hurry up i'm running out of time i can't be a race car driver much longer um so i was like screw it we're putting a cage in this thing we're going whole ham Bought some suits. I convinced my uh, girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, Abby, mm -hmm. to drive for me. Yeah. And uh, did it. And as the time has gone on, it's just turned into a uh, – it's done a couple stage rallies, but it's turned into such a purpose-built hill climb monster at this point. Mm -hmm. So everything now at the car, on the car, there's, I can't think of a single thing that is factory – other than maybe the front subframe is wow. maybe the only thing okay. that's unmodified at this point. Um, yeah. And yeah, I've done the whole everything. drive train of the brakes, everything. Yeah. Everything. It's, it's even a different rear subframe than stock, um, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like the, the front pickup for the, uh, rear trailing arms the one that bolts to the underside of the car with three bolts, even that has been off and I've cut that down a bit for weight. Um, wow. you know, literally there has still some parts of the front little U, U subframe thing, but that yeah. has been cut down and modified and it's only there because it serves a purpose that I have accepted the weight penalty because I needed to serve the purpose that it serves that kind of, that kind of level of modification. Sure. Well, and, and so just to be clear, so there was a point or there was a period when you first got the car that it was your daily driver. It and was a it, daily all the way through 
through at least its first hill climb championship it's on my daily. Okay. Uh, and, and you put the cage in, so you basically, you it had seen competition, but it was still kind of streetable, and, and, and you it was your daily, and then you basically have taken it from that point to the point where it is now, where it is it has a cage in it, and it's a full, full-blown full race car. Yeah, so even after the cage, um, I still dailyed it for probably a year or two. Um, it was a straight-piped, caged, six-point harness, um, no air conditioning. That That's commitment. Yeah. <laughs> so, nice. but, I mean, my drive to work at that point was about 30 or 40 minutes and it was all mountain driving and it okay. took easily 15 minutes off my commute time. Not that I can don't, <laughs> um, but it just happened to get there faster for some reason. Uh, yeah. It was a surprise, but um, yeah. So it, and it eventually got to the point. It really wasn't so much, the cage or something like that the noise that got me well the noise a bit because once i went twin scroll it got significantly louder hmm. and the graphics package the livery got in in depth enough that it was too much of a pain to strip it off either it was too loud visually okay. to daily it i was getting pulled over a lot and then sure it was it became too loud you know audio audibly wise too the twin scroll straight piped megaphone is is just a little bit too loud even when i'm going really easy on it so mm -hmm. now once i kind of crossed that bridge and decided no more daily driving it uh it has allowed me to go more whole ham on stuff so like right now for the hill climbs we're not required to run um, a lot of the stuff that's there for street legality or for like bad weather racing. So I have no wipers, no headlights. They're just blank at this point. No HVAC. Um, it still has a heater core. So I can, like if you know, I need to race in the fog, it takes 10 or 15 minutes to put the, the blower motor back in and the wipers back on. Mm. I can, I can be in bad weather mode, but you know, it's it's allowed me once I made the decision to make it a full competition only car. It still has plates. I can drive it if I put headlights on it. <laughs> and if you put headlights on it, okay. Yeah, it still has yeah. brake lights. So yeah. it's good. Um, which are really there in case, for the most part, because I haven't made blanks yet, because the back uh -huh. of the car is so light already, and if I'm broken down on a hill climb there aren't flag stations around every corner so i want to be able to have flashers or something like that so someone can see that i'm stopping the road or something so well and i would say even so. on, even for a track day having taillights so that people know that you're getting on the brakes is is a good thing yeah you're, you're not going to surprise if someone people. is worried about rear ending me then i'm not having a good track day so <laughs> that's that that's a fair right? point i guess no commitment maybe it was a brag okay okay <laughs> We talked about being a humble driver, and I don't like that. So yeah, okay. I thought that was a tagline off your grinder profile. Yeah. Oof. <laughs> just on, for man. you, Ryan. Man. Yeah. Well, well, be it. So yeah, maybe just real quick. Tell us about your race car. So where did where did that start, and and where did you pick it up, and and where is it now? My me? race car. Um. Oh yeah, be it. Me, me, this guy. Um, he, he only has one race car to talk about. You have a couple. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're going to get through the, the, the single, um, single race this, car. This is going to be pretty quick. Yeah. Actually, my friend was uh, looking for some money. He was like low on cash. He had sure. a broken down Civic that got broken into with like the harness cut up because they stole DCU and then they jacked up the ignition and he was like looking for like some extra cash i threw him some money for his car and just kind of like kind of snowballed from there like i really just bought it just to help him out honestly mm. and then like i ended up like trying to make it into a fun car i started doing like a single cam turbo build mm -hmm. and then like scrap that did like a b series then scrap that then now it turned into like this h22 H, H to B thing that's kind of like a Frankenstein motor. Yeah. Now that's going to change into this K series right. thing that we talked about last podcast. 
So like, it's always been this like evolving thing. It's always just a fun car for me. It's not like sure. a dedicated like track car. It's just more just for me to just have fun and just to build. Honestly, like I like more building than like driving. Honestly, but like sure, that's just me. Well, and you guys, you do have do you have a cage in the car at this point or not? I have the auto power bolting cage, right? Okay, which I kind of want to get rid of because it's pretty sketchy. Yeah, well, and and for you, <laughs> you never daily drove that car, so that that has always been like you. It's kind of like a little bit like Tasso, where you got the car. It was not a, a purpose built race car, but the only thing it's ever done f with you is go out to the track and stuff. I never daily drove it. I did drive it on the streets because I did have plates for it just to put just fucking just to drive it sure. on the street just because. Sure. Know. Well, I mean, in any of these cars can be registered. Yeah. Yeah. Honda boy stuff. Yes. Well, <laughs> hey, Nigel down there. So, Nigel, can you tell us a little bit about your car? So I'll try to paint a beautiful word picture like Tasso did. Um, my my dad, when I was growing up, bought a 2003 WRX, um, almost new. Mm -hmm. We were like the second owner of it, and the first owner had had it for like a month. Tried to drag race it, realized it wasn't great for drag racing in stock form, uh, mm -hmm. and got rid of it. So we got the car with like no miles on it, and all they did basically was like put a clutch in and sold it to my dad um so that was like i had learned to drive before this because i grew up like on a ranch but um that was kind of the car i learned how to drive in like i took my driver's license test in that car and so like i had this love of like the 2003 wrx and i was mm -hmm. like okay, cool so um, i had a truck and it was garbage and didn't do anything right at all and my dad was like we need a truck for like the family to use so what if we um trade in your truck on a new truck and then we'll give you the wrx in return and i was like yeah yeah let's do that yes please that's <laughs> incredible <laughs> mm -hmm. so i immediately took it to high planes like within a week of owning it myself um to see you know do I want to track this car? Is that something I'm going to be into? And the answer was yes and no. Yes, I'm into it. No, I don't want to track this car because this mm. is like super sentimental and, you know, it's bone stock. There's absolutely nothing done to it. And I kind of like that. Um, it's kind of rare to see completely untouched WRXs. Yeah. Um, and at that point, it had nearly 2,000 miles, 200,000 miles on it. And, so I started looking around on like the used market for uh, any WRX. I didn't care what it was. I didn't care what condition it was in. I was like, I need a car that's specifically for, for the track to go like as race car as I want with it. It's going to be a second car and I'll just baby this daily. Um, when I bought my current race car, uh, it's also a blue Bug Eye WRX. When I bought it, they both had 208,000 miles. They both had hood dents in exactly the same places, and they both had like paint peeling from the hood scoop in the exact same place. Like it was bone stock, also completely like untouched stock wheels and everything. Like they were mirror images of each other, except the race car was wingless. Okay, so they're twins um, basically. It's super weird, and I bought it totaled and. Um, we think it was just like hail damage because there's nothing wrong with the car. Um, mm -hmm. and then you know, the first weekend I bought it, um, I invited one of my buddies over who's much more uh mechanically inclined than I am because, as I'm sure we'll repeatedly talk about in this podcast, I'm completely mechanically incompetent. Um, <laughs> we gutted the entire car like, no headliner, no floor. We got the mm -hmm. dash out, we took like the whole interior out down to bare metal um, just for the sake of like, cool, it's a race car. Let's get rid of all right. this stuff you're never going to use. Right. Um, 
and we did a weld in rear half of the cage um the front half i have in tubes just sitting around because i haven't gotten to it mm-hmm. um and immediately found like a bunch of stuff I wanted to upgrade and um it's kind of just snowballed from that as like i wanted it to be a dedicated like track car for fun and kind of just picking and choosing what stuff i wanted to do to it for you know real competition purpose really just i want to do this so i'm going to do it um i didn't ever have a class that i wanted to compete in i wasn't building it for anybody else other than like this seems fun i want that Gotcha. Um, so, so very similar to Viet's story where you, you got it and you just immediately started modifying it to make it into a track or, or fun car, but not really anything, at least the race car was not something that you daily or anything like that. It just, it quickly well, became just a purpose built race car. It's also where I was still dailying it for quite a while. Um, oh, really? Because fully well, functional and like I didn't have I didn't have a lot of exhaust on it until a couple of years ago when I did the full motor build. Um, I just had suspension and it was just like coilovers, nothing crazy. Um, and there was no livery or anything on it. So it was basically just dailying a car with half cage and harnesses. Um, and the idea was to try and keep the mileage down on my actual daily um, because I wanted to last forever because I love it. Sure. <laughs> Um, nice. So, so that actually blue, is still the blue, the blue bug eye that your family still has is that the car you learned to drive in? Yeah, he said yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, my audio is bad. That's um, cool. That's cool to have both cars still. Yeah, I, had um, I keep parking them side by side to each other and just taking more like photos of like this is what it used to be and this is what it is now. Mm-hmm. Yes. We we won't um, we won't get into how many WRXs you have currently, Nigel. Because I think you and you and Dusks could actually give each other a run for your money. Uh, maybe uh, he think I think he's got me beat on Subarus, right? I think he does. Has three. That didn't come through. He actually four? he actually has four. Yeah. Oh, we've Man. lost Nigel, but. All right, so so Dussex, let's let's move on to you as far as so how many boy, let's just say let's talk about two of your race cars. You just have to pick two of them. Yeah, let's I don't just know. talk about the Subarus. <laughs> okay, let's let's keep it to Subarus. Cuz I don't even I don't even Do you know how many race cars you have currently? Is it is it under a dozen? I don't know if I would call Just a list. I don't know if I would even call them all race cars. Okay. I mean, I have a 2003 M3 a 1993 325i that I did rally cross and some track stuff with. I've got a 1987 Prelude that I autocrossed for like four or five years. Got a 1991 Honda Civic that I bought that's uh, B swap now that I bought to do wheel to wheel with. Hmm. Um, then we have the 2002 WRX and the I don't even know what year this yellow Subaru is. So just a handful of them. Just handful a handful of cars. What was that? Six. <laughs> That was six. Yeah, I think yeah. that was six. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, so let's. I mean, yeah, let's. Like I said, yeah. Let's talk the about Subarus. the super race cars. So, so where did each of those okay. start with you? So for me, uh, the blue car, which is like kind of, it's the car I've had. I bought in 2017. It's the car that I've had the longest, and that was definitely in this, this, talking about built not bought and bought not built, you know, paradigm. It was technically my built car, the car that I ended up building. It came with like a stage two tune or a stage three tune or whatever with the VF34 and some basic like pretty tastefully modded, um, but really standard Subaru stuff. Um, but it, all of it ended up getting overhauled, obviously. But some of the stuff kind of like Tasso's car um, with the light mods I had, it kind of got me started in the direction. And then basically was able to, well, spent the money foolishly or not so foolishly into the direction of the car is in now. So the car yep. was, you know, on 17s, uh, five-speed transmission, you know, a VF34 access port tune, and that was pretty much it. So modified WRX, but, and, and you, you daily drove that for a bit. 
Yeah, I did. I mean, it, it's not my most comfortable car I had at the time. I had the M5 as well. And I think at the time I also had a, a 528 station wagon and that thing was just like a dream sickle to drive. But, but yeah, I did drive it occasionally. And I, I like driving the variety of stuff too. It, it's like mm-hmm. personality thing. Like today, I feel like, you know, back in yeah. those days. And, um, but yeah, I did drive it for a while. I mean, up until when I really started doing a lot of road course racing. Okay. So and then, and, and you put the cage in it, you, you basically took it from kind of like a lightly modified stock car to where it is now, which is approaching, you know, like insanity. Which, yeah. I just, at did, some point it's going to be nuts. Yeah. I did a, an article with Counterster Media and they wanted me to list out the modifications. And I'm like, what? Like, I haven't done that since like 2018. So it, it's kind of, it's kind of fun because you, you feel dumb. You're like, I can't believe I spent this much money on the car. But the other part of it, it's kind of like, this is literally the cool thing about the blue car was, and I, I feel like Tasso probably feels the same way about his rally car and stuff too. It's, it's been the, it is my dream build. Like if I was going to have a Subaru dream build, there's stuff that you learn that, you know, not everything is that glitters is gold. So there's parts on the car that I don't care for as much. So that I would like to replace with other stuff. But, but ultimately, I mean, it's, it's, like Tasso was saying, I mean, there's really not many parts on the car that have been untouched and has mm. have survived, survived my torture. But, yeah. and that's, I mean, that's, and I think that's super cool. I, you get your own flair, you know, you get your, you get to like your own personality, like Nigel's car, like all of our cars, you know, the, the built cars have their own like personality and the taste that kind of represent kind of how we are, you know, mine might be a little bit more flamboyant because I'm a little bit more obnoxious than the rest of us, but, but I mean, it is, that is kind of the, the fun aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and if we, if we kind of stop there before we talk about the yellow car, sure. one of, one of the advantages in coming into it this way, and I think a lot of, a lot of enthusiasts would have a similar progression is you have the car, you like it, you like modifying it to make it better. And then it gets to that point, like, well, Hey, if I really want to take this to the next level, the next level is, some level of competition where okay one there's a big benefit to me taking weight out of the car Mm -hmm. so so now i'm at a point where if i really want to go to that next level i need to take out a lot of the the daily comforts if you will uh to to save weight or and or to bring in a cage or or like a half cage like nigel said from from a safety aspect Mm -hmm. to really take it to the next level so you kind of get halfway down to the the progression of the car and then like that's kind of the point of a return where it becomes more of a purpose-built competition car versus something that you're you know daily driving twelve thousand miles a year still but then also trying to compete with and so the i guess the advantage one of the advantages of that is it's exactly the way you want it to be at that point when Mm -hmm. when you when you make that next move you've got it to where you want it to be and then you're just bringing in these couple small changes to then make it so you can now compete with the car. Right. Yeah. So, so the alternative to that is to buy a race car that is already purpose built, take delivery of it, and then, and then start off. Now, before we jump to your yellow car, I will say for, for us as the shop, we've done, we've done both. Um, our first two rally cars were both rally cars that we basically bought as turnkey, like this logbook competition rally cars that we just basically took on and then, and then started camp- campaigning with them and made modifications, you know, through the, through the course of having them. The third rally car, which is currently our, I think it's black still, the black one, um, that we built from the ground up. And then the Pikes Peak car, that one, uh, actually, like the small story behind that, it was a flood car. There was a, 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 a crazy flood in Boulder in 2013, and that WRX, for some reason, was stuck in the back lot. They couldn't get it out. It was underwater for two weeks. The interior, of course, was trashed, but we, we discovered that the engine was in good running order, and at that point, that's where we kind of inherited it, and it turned into to the Pikes Peak car that it is now. So we've We've, we've bought in two, two race cars, and then we've also built two race cars. And so we've had some interesting, some interesting experiences in both regards, uh, but certainly like 
kind of, I guess kind of to like what Tasso had, was looking for a competition car, there's certainly an advantage or can be an advantage in just instead of trying to build from the ground up, just finding a car that's like 60 to 80% of what you want that already maybe has some of like a cage and some of the safety equipment in it, you buy that and then you just kind of tweak it from there. So Ryan, that's kind of where you're at with at least the yellow car. So maybe talk about some of that experience. What's that been like? Sure. So yeah, so we bought the yellow car. We got a pretty good deal on it. Um, part of, you know, all the circumstances and stuff behind it. But it's, uh, for the listeners and the, the viewers that don't know, it's an old super endurance car from Japan, super Takayu car. And, um, and it is a factory built car um, by Provo Eiffel for Subaru. So it's pretty much like from the, the ground up, it's a non van built from the ground up race car where everything is seam welded stuff that like I've never even considered or would have ever considered before is done to it, you know? And then there's a lot of things that you look at from like a replication standpoint. There's like, well, that's surprisingly simple. Like it's kind of silly. I've spent so much money as a workaround to this one aspect when like hmm. that's a solution right there. And so, you know, about that car uh, with the intention to do not nearly as fast stuff with it, like the blue car, learning from kind of the, mis I wouldn't say the mistake, but chasing the, that time, you know, there's other aspects of driving that I like to do and driving is part of it. And this car is built at a level already where it's like 80%, maybe 90% there, like, sh like structurally and mm -hmm. the bones and everything, you know, and with some more money and some time, we're getting the car kind of revamped enough so that uh, it can go out and start doing more stuff and get in some drive time in and stuff. That's awesome. And, and kind of like what we talked about last in the last episode, a little bit in mm -hmm. with yours, having purchased like a, a competition car that really, was, was built to compete at a pretty high level when it was built, you, there's a mm -hmm. lot that you actually learn just by, just by getting it and having it so that you can actually really go through the thing. There, there's a lot of details that you've seen and gone, okay, that's a really good idea that I need to duplicate on mm -hmm. any of these other cars that I'm building. And that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And I will say, well, I would say the other thing that I really liked or that I think is an advantage in buying like a, I guess I'll speak specifically to like a logbook rally car, something where you are going to be competing in a series that has a pretty um, strict and well-defined rule book. If you, so uh, I guess just a, a footnote here, what a logbook is when you, when you have a, a rally car that's logbooked or a race car, race car that's logbooked, you have a, basically it's it's a book that records every event that the car it has been to and competed in, and so each time you go through tech, they will sign off on your logbook for the event. So when you if like in our case when we bought the logbook with the or the car with the logbook, then we went on to the next event, and so we were we were the sixth event for that car and 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 all the subsequent events. But we knew that that car had been through tech and passed all these other five events. So we knew that basically we, as long as the car was in good running order, we were going to make it through tech and we could get through, um, which is, which is, you know, I mean, it's comforting to know that to a certain extent versus building a rally car from scratch. Cause when we, with the black car, the third one that we built kind of more or less from scratch, going through tech was a little bit more nerve wracking because we were taking this car on this maiden voyage and it hadn't been through tech yet. And we were really, you know, making sure that we had, read all of the details in the rule book and we had everything that we needed to get through tech. Um, so that's, it, it, we, we ended up making it through fine, but it was, a, it was like, that was a pretty stressful tech experience. And, and for the Pike Speed car too, even though we were only like about, let's call it 30 to 40% of the build of that car before it went through tech, that, that first time through was like, well, okay, let's see what they're fine. You know, like, you're paying a lot of close attention as all the scrutineers are going through the car and, mm -hmm. and like they, they do this like a test on the, the wall thickness of your cage and all this sort of stuff. It's like, all right, let's hope that this uh, comes through. Okay. But, it, and it did, but it's just, you know, hopefully that's the case for, for everybody. But I think it, it brings up um, a point that I was hoping that we were going to talk about with the whole built not pop thing or building versus buying thing. A lot of the advantage to buying a car 
um, or I guess I'll rephrase this, two of the kind of the caveats to buying a car, the two kind of major hangups. The biggest one is whether or not that car was built for what you plan on doing with it. Sure. Is that what Ryan is running into here? It was built for a series that doesn't even exist on this continent. So he's had <laughs> a fair amount of work to, to reprep mm -hmm. that car for what he's mm -hmm. doing. And there's absolutely value to the other stuff that does carry over between the series. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, right. If you want to compete in stage rally, you know, say, you know, now that ARA has been around for a couple of years, buying a car that is log booked with ARA, sure, it gets you through tech on those chassis preparation things more easily. Um, and then I think the other kind of caveat I want to talk about here, because it does also apply to your Super Takayu car, is factory built cars or, um, you know, uh, a car, you know, built by a, a business, um, you know, whether that's a prep shop or a factory itself or pro drive for SDI for WRC even, right? The driving factor for that car is financial, not competition necessarily, right? And the, the distinction there is that, so I noticed there's things on your car that I have done to lighten my car. And maybe in a particular example, it has to do with minimum weight requirements or something like that for, for the series that that car was built for. But, you know, you take a, you know, an, an so-called unlimited build car, and usually it's built by the amount of man hours that a company is willing to pay to have a car prepped, right? Versus time to me is free. Um, hmm. my, as I've built my car, it hasn't ever been limited by the amount of man hours that I'm willing to pay someone else to cut stuff off the car for lightness, for example, right? But, I mean, so there are advantages there right you bought a car that has amazing suspension work done there's absolutely value and even just paying for the knowledge of of what they did to prep the suspension on your yellow car but it's also limited in what the build cost was because that company had to pay employees for man hours mm -hmm. you know me not having to that's not the limiting factor for me so sure this, this is kind of things that i thought about looking at your yellow car in terms of the built, not bought kind of thing. Well, and, and it's kind of related to that. One of one of the takeaways that we've had here, um, especially with the Pike Speed car, is there's like what the hope would be is if you're buying a race car that's already been built and already been used, that it that there's hopefully they have a lot of good solutions to problems that you might well run into. The interesting thing that we've run into with the Pikes Peak car is like if we if we had it to do over right now, if we had another shell right now today that that we just had to build the same car, but we we, we could start fresh now, we would do a lot of things differently than we did yeah, initially. Me too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so I guess that's one of the tricky parts about coming into it from zero and building the car up to that point is you're going to learn a lot along the way. And the hope would be that is if you're buying a purpose built race car, that maybe they've found some solutions to problems that you don't even know you're going to have yet, but they might not. And mm -hmm. so like I, the, the, the simplest one for us is the cage design. It, like if we, if we had it to do over, we would have a whole different set of requirements for the cage. The cage that's in the Pikes Peak car is actually an FIA plus spec cage. Cause at the time Pikes Peak had a lot of, additional requirements even above and beyond what the FIA spec would be. So it's a very thoroughly built cage, but we did not optimize like the ability to get in and out of the car, like getting in and out of that car is, is really difficult. And it's because of we, because of some of the choices that we made with the cage. So, and, and then also from a weight saving standpoint, kind of like what you were saying, Tasso, we, we, this is, we learned and I'm, um, it's a, I mean, it's a shame Scotty's not with us on here, but he did some crazy stuff to save weight that once he figured out like how much weight was hiding in like the B pillars and the C pillars of the car, just because of the reinforcement that once you put the cage in there, you don't need, or, or, or you need minimally, that he saved, I mean, if we built that same car today, we could probably save at least 150 pounds with a new build versus what we currently have. And now the as long cage, as your class allows that. 
Correct. True. And and as long as as long as we have the cage in the car, we can't. I mean, there's there's nothing that we can do to go back. Now yep. mm-hmm. that that ship has sailed. So that's one of those. Those are two really big lessons that we've learned since that car was built. And so, like, yeah, it, I don't know. It definitely would do it differently. So I don't know. I guess it maybe falls in between. Sure. Between both yeah, you're, you're paying for someone else to make those mistakes so that you don't have to pay to do it twice. Um, sure. You know, so there's there's absolutely value there. And I'll say that I'm not thoroughly on the fence one way or the other in terms of built or bought. Um well, I am thoroughly on the fence. I'm not thoroughly, you know what I'm trying to say, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm at the point now with my own build where the amount of effort I have to go to to save, you know, half pounds, whole pounds, stuff like that, I've almost debated cutting out the cage that I have and starting from scratch to do it lighter and better and for, for better chassis rigidity. Um, now that adds, I mean, we're talking a couple – several thousand dollars in a recade yeah. for a car right and a lot of work and time um so i don't know i probably won't at the time when i built the car i figured i would wrap it around a tree before i ever got to that point where i needed to you know make that little performance increase mm-hmm. and it that hasn't and i'm kind of waiting for that to happen <laughs> so then <laughs> then i get to start another car from scratch and I'll take all these lessons with me but I don't know. Yeah. It's a, you know, there's obviously not an answer one well, way or the other that stands out to me. And, and maybe the lesson is, like, before you would buy a purpose-built race car, um, it, it there, like, I guess the other, the other, the other angle that I would come at with all, all of what we just described is. Like if you could go out and rent a car, like if you're looking at getting into rally, if you can go out and rent a rally car and participate in even just one event so that you actually have a feel for, you know, getting in and out of the car. Okay. What is it like, you know, having to change a tire on stage or, or after a stage, but, but, you know, without your support crew, just a lot of like living with the car for a little bit, you're going to come at looking at a, a purpose built car in it from a different way than if you if you're coming into a kind of blind um and that's where like you know i have a whole bunch of different things that i would come in and look for and if i was going to be buying a car now with all of the experience that we've been through with the pike speed car and and the rally car as well just to make sure that it's done right so that you don't have to do like what toss is saying necessarily and and kind of even though it's built take it apart and kind of start over but I don't know. Ryan's moving around here, but yes. about your car, Ryan. Yes. Now he's getting in the car. Oh, there it is. <laughs> so, so with your car, it's, it's a, there's, again, there's a flip side to that, which is you might, you might buy a car knowing that you have to do all of this stuff, but mm-hmm. even knowing you have to do all of it, it's worth it because you know that like, like that your car has air jacks. Like right. that's something where that's, that is not something easy to install. Maybe you need it. Maybe you don't, but you've already now you have it so you can see how it works if you ever decide to put it in the other blue car you know you're going to learn a lot from just having those like there's there's a huge value in buying the car that you have with all of the modifications that are done to it because it will it will get to where it needs to be with i mean a relatively modest amount of work Um, but i mean i think you're still going to come out way ahead with it yeah i mean and, and a lot of that too and i think this is fair to say whenever you are buying a car um, as a race car, making sure that you are, you look at the actual cost of the vehicle that you're buying and the value of it as well. So when I was looking at this car, knowing that the cage was going to have to be totally redone, I, I reached out to my cage builder and told him like, Hey, like, this is what I'm looking at. What do you, th- how fixable is it? Um, what kind of cost are we thinking? And this is what I'm looking to purchase the car for. Do you think it's a good value? And so I think it's important to go into that with like a square head on your shoulders, knowing what it is, kind of what your expectation out of the car is, how much it's going to cost, and then everything in between. You know, like even, I mean, you could make the argument that Tasso and I both bought built cars when we initially bought them, but we didn't buy them uh, built as we've used as intended. 
Right. You know, maybe, you know, Tasso technically bought a national championship winning car for a rally cross, but that's not what he ended up doing with it, you know? And so there are, there are crossovers, you know, like you're saying, as long as you're, as long as you're like intuitive to it. I mean, Mm -hmm. Because there's all the nightmares, too. I mean, we could go over the nightmares of buying a belt car as well. Um, I mean, how it's assembled, how it's put together, and um, and the the not-so-fun mysteries that you find, you know, mm-hmm. when you look at one. That yeah. is a, a, something worth mentioning for the build wrap also. Um, yeah. Is there are a lot of things on my car that – are only easy to work on because I'm familiar with how they go together and come apart and stuff like that. So that really intimate knowledge of all the little inner workings of your car um, and all the little things you've done, you know, if I were to go sell this car right now, I would have to tell the buyer like, look, do you want to figure it out on your own? Or maybe I'll charge you an extra thousand dollars to tell you all the little random shit going on in there that you probably should know about. Right. Like, Mm -hmm. It has to come off this way. Otherwise, it's not going to come off or, you know, like that or well, you know, it, be routed like this. What that makes me think of is wiring. Yeah. Wiring, oh, wiring for a race car. <laughs> Good luck. Whew. Yeah. It, well, there, there's a lot of – well, it depends. There's, there's probably a bit of wiring that you're going to have to do to get a, a street car to be a competition car. But like once you have a competition car, like Pandora's box, I think is a fitting description of what you might potentially run into with wiring. And there's a point, right? Yeah. There's a point where a car becomes a nice enough or a high enough budget build with a bespoke motorsport level harness where the wiring is a dream at that point or comparatively. Right. But I don't know about you guys. My car is not there. My car has, I've tried to make everything removable. <laughs> That's a good start. So there aren't too many things that are literally hardwired to the car, but there are some things. Um, that I, mostly factory harnesses, but they've all been taken apart and gutted. So, like, I know what's there, especially, like, the fuel pump controller and stuff like that, right? Mm-hmm. That system is completely crazy. Um, in my situation, it works. It does what I need it to do. Um, but to try and, you know, take that or even I don't have a, a normal key like ignition cylinder because I love right. five plane switches. So I rigged up each of the positions on uh, in the key cylinder to its own individual switch. To, so start the car, like flip, switch, flip, switch, flip, switch. Right. And I love it. Um, but I made a little sub harness for that. Um and that, well, for one thing, it's all just red wires because it's what I had around when I got the Ansem <laughs> to do that to oh. do that project, right? Um, uh, yeah, I, we, I, we have made that mistake, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's a, uh, yeah, yeah. So I know, I know how to take my dash off, but if one of you guys tried to figure it out, you would have to cut wires probably. That has Oof. been the big joke too. There's four there's four fuel pumps in this car. And then there's also four switches on this little dash here. And I have flipped all those switches to see if it would change anything. And I have no idea what the switches do. Yeah. For all I know, the switches are for telemetry and radio communication. Right. I have no idea. I have no idea what they do. You and know? that's a and factory that's prepped like car. Saying. Right. Yeah. Right. That's not Tasso in his one plus car garage. That's that's a factory yeah. car, and you're still thinking, the hell's going on here? So, have, yeah. you, have you taken the exactly. the plate off and like, are they actually wired on the back as well? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> they're just blanks. It'd be hilarious yeah, if there's just I'm, extra switches for switches. You don't I'm have to do it now. To take some of this stuff apart. Yeah. Like. I'm just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. there's you know even lights on the dash that blink and at first i thought i was like oh that's weird that that light blinks when my foot's pushed in on um, the clutch and i realized like that's probably a check engine light and a code and then i look for like an obd2 port and there's no obd2 port you know it's like what right. the mm. fuck the just well, like, so yeah, they're with things yeah. yeah well and and like if you're buying a race car and it has a standalone in it 
I mean, yeah. that's something where it's now no longer factory wiring. Here's, here's a standalone ECU that has to be specifically wired to everything that it has to be wired to. Mm-hmm. Oof. You know, like, hopefully it's there. Hopefully it works. But yeah, I mean, you, you'd almost, yeah. you'd almost be worthwhile like back tracing all of the wires just so you have a, a decent picture of how did they put this thing in here? You know, just yeah. in case you have like a bunch of switches or lights that are flashing at you that like, yeah, I don't know what it means. I'm even on a yeah. standalone with a plug and play harness, but probably a fifth of those plug and play things have been reassigned by me. Wow. So you look at my car, you go, oh, look, it's a standalone plug and play. I can get this, I can get this uh, diagram off the internet. Right. Wrong. Nope. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, and yeah, it's, yeah, so there, there's a lot of things. There's definitely a lot of things to consider if you're looking at a car that has a lot of this stuff done. Is like you know the the the, the better, clearer picture you can get of of where you're coming in, the better, for sure. And especially and from this Hawaii. is all, yeah. and we're talking about race cars too. I mean, how about the project cars out there? How many people have bought somebody else's project car? that wasn't running that's like oh the engines yeah. everything you need is there and you get it together and you're like what the hell are like these don't go together like and yeah you just you just kind of realize i mean that's kind of how that civic was for me like oh it's got it comes with all this extra stuff and then you go and pick all that stuff up and you're like dude this is i don't even know what this stuff is for you know and just happy that some cars run but i mean that's that's the thing too right you know yep. you could buy so somebody be, else's project and just be struggling the whole time. Yeah. Would it be fair to say then that we have settled the argument toward build, not buy? Uh, uh, I mean, the thing we haven't talked about is how much money I've lost on the WRX and components <laughs> that failed as I try and yeah. figure out how to make this go. I mean, sure, just the, the, the amount of the amount of failure, broken parts I've had on the blue car is more than what I spent on this car that runs. So, so we'll refine it then. <laughs> well, buy advice, build the race car. Uh, maybe. Well, it, it's for some people that don't like to just build things, kind of like yeah. I do. That's true. Yeah, it's, I don't work on cars anymore. <laughs> See? <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I, well, mean, I don't know I, if I believe I'm that. I'm kind of like Viet. I like I like the building and putting stuff together. I actually like having both because what happens is is when I feel like I've been in a slump. You know, last year we did this made this huge big jumps on the blue card. We're like, man, this is awesome. And now it's kind of like I'm in a financial slump where like you can't. It's just it's there's so many barriers. And now that this car's here, I'm seeing all these little things like, oh, I could do this to my blue car. I can do that to my blue car. I'm gonna put something like this on my blue car. And, it kind of like it, it has reinvigorated the idea process as well. I mean, it's it's kind of like a cheat sheet in some ways. So I think I think the the true argument, the true winning argument is having both. It's fun to have the thing that you can put your stamp on, and then it's fun to actually just drive a car that works, even if you don't know what the fucking sure. switches do. Right. <laughs> well, and and to be fair too, Ryan. I mean, you said that the reason that you got the yellow car is because you. You, you have a, the blue car, which is going all the way down the road of purpose-built time attack. But you right. wanted to do some wheel-to-wheel racing also. And you knew right. that, okay, yep. this, this car is like 80% down the road of purpose-built time attack. It's going to really suck mm-hmm. to wheel-to-wheel with that car. Like, just as a, right. the first example that, or reason for that that comes up to the top of my mind, you've got this wide-body fiberglass – fiberglass wide body kit on that blue car to fit the tires and wheels and tires that you're fitting. If you're rubbing right. fenders with somebody, like all of a sudden your, your custom wide fender, wide, uh, wide, I can't say it, but you know what I mean? <laughs> wide right, body right, right. F- fiberglass kit. It's just, it, you just wrecked it for that car yeah. to like, look right again. You're going to have to replace that probably not easy to get expensive piece. Yeah. That's not ideal. Yeah. But the, the right. yellow car, it, it was wheel-to-wheel raced. It, that's what it was pr- mm-hmm. purpose-built to do. You know that, like, yes, there's, there's, the cage has to be fixed. There's some tweaks that have to be made. 
but that car was successfully doing this other thing, this other job of wheel to wheel racing. So you know that like you, you've got it in there, you just got to go through a few things and then you should be able to do that kind of racing with it. Right. Absolutely. And I mean, and it's, it's cheaper to campaign too. I mean, this car's on two forty fives. My blue car's on three fifteens. You know, this car has, um, it runs regular, I say pump gas, but it's really not pump gas. It runs, you know, petrol like ethan or um like race gas yeah. which i think is easier to come across than like consistent e85 if you're trying to do like endurance racing you'd use way less fuel uh like pump fuel than you have to do like e85 i mean there's a lot of a lot of advantages already with this car to, to it's more optimized for that yeah. style of it, driving. it's it's well, basically it's a ahead, stock buddy. yeah it's basically a stock engine so like the yeah. power is lower from like if you want to do a 24 hour race i mean that, that right. which is what it was which is was what it was used for mm-hmm. you know there's like the ease of replacement of parts the availability of parts it's different than something where it's it's like a lot of custom built one off stuff you know first you know right. from that the, uh, the hoonigans coon or did they coin the simple seat time daily phrase was it those simple guys that did simple seat time stallion or whatever then, yeah, yeah whatever. Rather simp- simple seat time stuff. So it's just your simple seat time car happens to be a prestiged factory built car. That's all. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Just because I mean it fell it all fell into place for sure. Right. Absolutely. Cool. I wasn't actually like out there looking for this car. It's kind of it's also a car that came to me, but it doesn't mean that there aren't cars like this out there. Sure. Um, I was really considering. This was back last summer. There was on um, Bring a Trailer. It was a really nice um, BMW M Sport um, race car built in 2012, and um, and it was similar to this, except it was still a legal cage. But I mean, it had pretty much all the bones and stuff to race, you know, ready to go turnkey endurance racing. And I was heavily considering it. So when this car came up, you know, for me to buy it, I was like, you know what? Like it's already an idea. I was already embracing. Let's embrace the Subaru and really have a piece of history too. But sure. I mean, it's there. Cars like these are out there, you know. For sure, it it helps too. Like, you've really gone far with the Subaru platform, and mm-hmm. so having another car on the Subaru platform, you you have a lot more familiarity with it. So you know what to look for, and and you knew the details of the yellow car that fit with right. what you wanted to do with it. That you knew that that was that car was built in the way that it really was 80% of the direction that you wanted to go with it already. But you, you'd, you, you wouldn't have known that if you wouldn't have had the experience with Subarus that you had to that point. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. The, I learned a lot with the blue car, um, not just about Subarus, but about what I enjoy about driving and what I enjoy about working on cars. I mm-hmm. love going fast in the WRX I don't like going slow and doing slow time trials. Like I've done that with the Civic. I mean, it, it wears on me. The Subaru scares me, you know, like the blue mm. car is just so much faster now that it just, it's terrifying, but in, in a great way to go slower, it's nice to have that proximity, you know, and you're a new driving style and new strategies. And it's just something that I know that it's going to push I did a couple of endurances in the last couple of years already. I know it's going to push me in my driving and it's just, it's a different experience, you know? Sure. So it's fun. I mean, it's a lot of fun. And now I have something to do it, obviously going forward or sure. soon anyway. It's, it's interesting. We both have had an experience where we had like an escalation of commitment to a particular thing mm-hmm. and it got more and more and more specialized to the point where now, we each have a race car that is at the bleeding edge of what it's built to do. Mm-hmm. And then we're like, eh, okay, let's do something else also. Right. Yeah. And, I mean, <laughs> well, something that's... we talked about in the podcast before, um, about like the sustainability of whatever you're doing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's okay to have that extremely specialized piece of equipment as long as you don't continue to just beat your head into the ground in that same specialty, it's not only good for your driving to diversify your bonds, but it's also good for your mental health to, uh, to, you know, do a bond. I mean, it's for me, it's, you know, biking and mountain biking, 
you know, do a lemons race here and there and, you know, mm-hmm. going to a track day even because pavement is not my specialty, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and for you, you know, this this touring car or endurance car build is there, but you, I mean, you've always had something like that that's helped you stay, stay sustainable, yeah. whether it's autocross or rallycross or, or any one of these things. And it's a... Uh, I think it, it becomes an important thing to consider in whatever your race car journey of building or buying is, is a. Well, and what, what the car is and what you want to do with it. I mean, that's, that's the really mm-hmm. interesting point of what, what you just said, Tasso, and, and kind of about the angle of building the car, because like I was saying with the Pikes Peak car, like if, if you really want like the very lightest chassis possible that you're building the car on, well, now we would we would make a lot of different choices and do a lot of other things than we did with that car. It it was fine for a long time, but then once we really got serious about weight, like it, weight was not really a consideration for the first few years that we ran that car nearly as much, and and to a certain extent, aero, because mm-hmm. like especially in the back of the car, for like a diffuser, if you're really going to get to the point where you're trying to get serious with aero, the design of the rear of the car that's that's something to consider yeah you got a fuel cell hanging down back there right correct yeah Yeah. it's like so if we ever put a diffuser on there that at a minimum we're probably going to have to raise the fuel cell up up at least a couple of inches um you know like the point is is that like if you if you don't have as clear of a picture of where you're going you might actually have to kind of like what you're saying Tasso, pull the cage out and start over (laughs) Because yeah. like you're you're building it, you're going in one direction, and then you realize, well, but I didn't do this and that. Nuts. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, we got to back up so that, and and start over so that we can put in these aspects to it. Yeah. Um. And that's I mean we've talked about that, just in in general on the podcast before about having an idea of what what kind of racing you want to do, what kind of what what you want to do with the car, and having kind of a the the more clear a picture you can have of that as you're starting, especially with a build, the more you can make sure that you're going to get the right, you know, do, put in the right details for the car um, as you're putting it together so that you can be competitive and do what you want to do with it. Sure. I think it just goes to show just how hard it is and not perfect it is to build that solution too, where, you know, you guys have like a real solid built, you know, hill climb car. And then even Tasso has spent a lot of time. I mean, we joke about all the time how he just sits in the garage with his, you know, micro brew of the week, just staring at what he can do and change on that. Yep. And even with the best intentions, you can still miss something, you know, two or three steps back. And yeah. so, I mean, and so, so, I mean, not beating yourself up about it, like, even with the best intentions and shooting straight with the arrow that you have, it, it's still, you know, there's still going to be things you're going to learn. Still going to be things that are going to, you might want to change. And that might be one of the most important lessons overall, which is that just like any project car, a race car is never done. Yeah. Right. You're, you're always looking at it. You're always trying to refine it. You're always trying to improve it. It's never, it's never like 100% done. Yeah. It's, it's true about um, like the perfect lap, right? You're always chasing that perfect right. lap. There's only something. It's the same thing with the car too, right? Mm-hmm. But as long as you get out there and keep turning laps, as long as you keep working on the car and don't forget that the purpose of the car is to race or to compete or, you know, whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Both of those things you will always work at improving at, but it's the journey is the journey is, is part of it too. Right. It's, Mm -hmm. you're never going to get that perfect lap or that perfect build unless you start turning laps and start turning wrenches. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, and like, I guess kind of what I was alluding to earlier is sometimes you actually have to get in and live with the car, race it a few, like a few events to actually really find out well, what is actually really important and what is not as important. You know, yeah. I mean, it's like how much is weight savings important versus strength in a rally car? Mm-hmm. You know, like mm-hmm. the, these are, these are things <laughs> that you, you have to, uh, you have to, you have to get, a little bit of firsthand experience to like decide where you land on that decision. You can't, it's, it's not something you can shoot from the hip as much. That's a tricky one too, because, um, people have talked about this, you know, build, build a strong car, build the car, a little turn laps. 
But and I I didn't really. I went with the fast car route right away. And I've learned some lessons. Sure, there's things I would do differently. But I don't know if I hadn't have gone as fast early on if I would still be doing it. You know, mm-hmm. I, we've talked about this in terms of um, you know going out there just to finish versus going out there to try and win. Right. Uh, right. You know, if I was just cruising around doing some rallies and ending up in the back of the pack and you know, whatever rallies for me are weird because I never finished them. But if I was just trying to finish some hill climbs um, and not even try and, you know, versus I won my first season that I competed in, I don't know if I would have stuck with it to the point that I have now, not to say that people don't or people are wrong um, for making that their goal. Um, but just a, to, to factor that I've thought about over the years is, you know, if I hadn't have just gone. Oh, did we just lose Tasso? Oh my gosh. Dang. I figured I would be the one that got dropped. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. If I would have well, kept doing it, you know? Oh, I don't know yeah, oh. totally. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And he's back folks. He's back. <laughs> we, we lost you a little bit there, but. I freeze? You froze. <laughs> but it's. Yeah. It's it's a very valid point and and kind of just know going in that like like the race car is never done. You are like you're never going to be fully committed to any one thing that you're doing with the car, you know, with within reason. So I mean, you, you always always have to be willing to explore because like I know Tasso for you, at this point it's a lot more appealing to you I think to be able to run the hill climbs to be a to be able to build the car the way you want to build it, to achieve the goal of being as fast as possible versus put underneath the, the kind of the ceiling of this very specific rule book of stage rally where you can't really do a lot of the stuff that you want to do with the car. Like it's, it's literally just not, yeah. it's not allowed for, for the, for the purposes of that, of that series. Well, that's why I like looking at your time attack builds too. Um, yeah. Time attack is similar to that, right? Where, you know, the limit, Yes, there is a rule book, I'm sure, but yep. the limit is largely what you're willing to put in in your own build, whether that's you're building towards a lap time, building towards a vehicle, or building towards a driver. Um, you know, it, it, it makes say, time attack. Well, I would almost say the time attack rules are, it's like, how far are you willing to go? If you're not willing to go that far outside of the, like, beyond the, the general framework of a stock car it's a lower class if you're willing to like completely gut the thing and remake and re-envision like suspension mounting points chassis mounting points whatever that's where you you go up in class because you're they want to you're, you're you're kind of put up against people that are, are willing to make the same level of modifications that you are to a certain extent and yeah, yeah i don't know you have to decide where you want to fall with that Mm-hmm. That's a hard one. The top. Oof. Unlimited. <laughs> Unlimited. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. Whatever. I think another I think uh, another pro category too and something to consider when you're building a car versus buying one is that provided you're buying a car that's pretty well sorted out, typically it's cheaper to buy them used especially than it is to build them and you get more seat time and we all agree that seat time makes you go faster. So sometimes there is an advantage in buying a car that's already built or at least nearly built where it needs to be, where Mm -hmm. you're not investing a ton of your time building the car and putting it together and working through the kinks as you are getting to drive it. I I think we're all pretty budget guys for sure. For sure. And and I think to a certain extent, the more, the more specialized or, or specific the class is, for instance, a rally car, like mm-hmm. when, when we bought our rally cars, they were both super production cars, which meant that they had to be largely close to stock. And really the majority of the modifications you could do were safety devices, like the cage and right. such. You know, at that point, like the cost of buying a car with a cage in it that was logbook that we knew was, was done properly and we could compete with was actually less than buying a new donor car to strip the interior out of and put a cage into it. And mm-hmm. so that's where it's just, it made more sense to just buy a turnkey vehicle. And, and then the other thing too is, is the time. I mean, putting a cage in a car yeah. is not a very quick process. 
And the development of a race car is not a quick process. I mean, our Pikes Peak car, I mean, this is going to be 2021, I think is going to be our eighth year running that car or ninth. Can't remember. But it's, it, I mean, we're still, I mean, we're not even like halfway to the, to the point of where the, the car really, I think, ultimately will, will land. But it, we're, we're having to figure out a lot of stuff along the way. Um, mm -hmm. versus that brings a, yeah. uh, a good point, I think. In, you know, a consideration for me for my next car, if I was going to build or buy, yeah. how limited the class is. So with a very limited class, I think it becomes more and more cost effective to buy a car versus building it because if there's only so many things that can be done, mm. then uh, it's, it's easier to pay to have someone else already have had done those things versus an unlimited class. You know, you can't buy a formula one car and go out there and be competitive. It's, and that's even not unlimited at all. Um, so let me find a better example than that. Well, time attack. I mean, an unlimited time attack car. Like, would you? Yeah, right. Yeah. I don't think. I don't think I would buy an unlimited time attack car. I would mm -hmm. want to build the unlimited right. time attack car because when when there are not very many restrictions of the rules, the decisions that you make of the of literally every step of the build of the car are going to add up to whatever the end result is. Right. You know, because because yeah. I mean, how much of the original chassis are you going to keep? Like literally even a yeah. decision like that. I mean, right. if it's an unlimited time attack car, I mean, that's like, that would be where you would start with the decision process. Like, are we going to keep most of the unibody? Are we going to keep half the unibody? Do we even need a unibody? Yeah. Well, it gets yeah. down to so many driver preference things too, right? When you have a really limited class, a spec Miata or an open light or naturally aspirated four wheel drive car or something like that, you have to learn how to drive quickly in that class versus building an unlimited car, you can build a car to suit your driving style. You know, if you want to be the guy that drag races to a corner, hauls on the brakes, makes it around, and then drag races to the next corner, mm -hmm. sure, you know, build your car to do that, right? Because you're not limited by a little Miata motor in your spec Miata car where you can't right. you have to learn to drive that, that class the way it's designed to be driven too, so. Yeah. And, and, and like to that, to that extent, like if you're, some people like are, are, are happiest in a, a lower power car where you can just kind of keep the gas matted the whole time. And, and it's, a, it's like a momentum car. You just have to keep the momentum up as best as you can through driver skill, modifying the car so that, so you can carry more speed through the corners and so forth. But then, you know, there's also the lure of, of the high horsepower build where, you know, this thing like, you actually start to see the the, the side uh, outside view windows go into plaid, you know, when you're at wide open throttle, but you, you kind of have to hold on. And it's, it's like every, every lap is like, well, I, I hope can, I can make it around one more time. I'm not sure what's going to happen. You know, like some people, that's what they want. You know, it's, it, yeah. you know, it's very different. Yeah. Well, so we settled it then. I think, I think we did. <laughs> Yes. The answer is we don't know. We don't know either. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, definitely. Above. Definitely like I think that this is a good conversation to have and and yeah, I mean uh, if geez, at this point if people are still listening or watching, um hopefully it gives you some good perspective on like how to approach your project, be it to building your car up or continuing to build it or or like there there's just so much to consider looking at a at a purpose-built race car to purchase. Um, you know, there's a lot of good reasons to do it, but I think the more that you can, the more understanding you can go into it with, the more clear a picture you can have of what you ultimately want to do with that car and how close that car that you're looking at is is to your end goal, the better. Um, and that's that's something that just nothing but research and and, and time will, will tell you. Yeah, that's a constant. The, the experience has a lot of value and there's yep. a lot lot of lessons learned from making mistakes whether you're building or buying so yeah and sometimes you learn more by making mistakes than by not by not making those mistakes yeah yeah so, man it's all a process well i think i think we're winding it down i think we've we've come to the conclusion so let's <laughs> let's uh i think it's good place as any to wrap it up for this episode 
So like I was saying before, yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're still watching or if you're getting to this point, thank you very much for, for staying, staying tuned and, and for, for watching and listening to us. We really appreciate that. Um, everybody here, you can find them on the internet. Uh, Viet, where can, where can people find you? Uh, the 919 Garage. Tasso. On Instagram. Yes. OTC Racing. OTC Racing. Dussex, where can they find you these days? DSX Motorsports and YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, all that good stuff. Nice. Nigel, where can, where can the good people find you these these days? WRX Buddy. At WRX Buddy. Perfect. And uh, as always, this, this podcast is brought to you by Flatterns Tuning. They're, they're our sponsor. They are us. So we, we greatly appreciate your support if you head over to Flatterns Tuning and just check out the site. We got a lot of cool blogs and videos and parts. You never know what you're going to find. So, yeah, thanks very much for listening. Thanks for your support. And uh, until the next episode, stay tuned. <laughs>